A lot of airports are built near water, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for this. First off, most airports are located in big cities, and big cities are usually built near some form of water anyway. Back in the day, before trucks and proper roads were built, goods were transported by ship. Having a river or ocean nearby was vital to deliver essential supplies to the cities, like food and building supplies. It also allowed for trading to boost the local economies. Because most people travel into big cities for business and holidays, rather than rural areas, it made sense to build the airports there. The high demand for travel meant that the airports were needed and also made them profitable. But that's not the only reason they're built near water. Big cities are usually super crowded, and airports require a lot of land. Imagine trying to find a space big enough in the middle of New York City to put an airport. It would be basically impossible. Areas next to water are usually a bit more rural, so there's more space than the big cities filled with skyscrapers. Some countries have even taken this one step further. Land is really scarce in Japan, so to build Kansai International Airport, the architects of Osaka headed three miles offshore to Osaka Bay to make a man-made island. The artificial island is 13,200 feet long and 8,500 feet wide. That's so big that it can even be seen from space. It took a whopping 38 months to complete, and travelers can get across to the main island of Honshu via car, railroad, or high-speed ferry. Kansai International Airport opened in 1994 and became the world's first airport to be built on the sea. Despite its location, it has the longest airport terminal in the world with a length of just under one mile. Airplanes also can't have any obstacles around them when landing. It would be really difficult to try landing a plane with obstructions. These include trees, mountains, buildings, and power lines. Over water, nothing will restrict planes from taking off or landing, making it much safer. On mountainous islands, runways are often parallel to the ocean, as the mountains are inland, just like in the Grand Canaria Airport located on one of the Canary Islands. It also links to safety reasons. If a plane has to cancel a runway landing and go back around again, there must be enough room for it to do this safely without hitting anything. It's also got to be able to climb back up into the air at a safe angle to avoid causing problems for the passengers inside. Reaching this safe altitude is much easier, quicker, and safer by the sea, compared to big cities or mountainous areas. Speaking of failed landings, pilots are trained to deal with engine failure on takeoff. If a plane reaches the right speed for takeoff, it has to leave the runway, even if the engine fails. But don't worry, planes can still fly with only one engine, it just requires a bit more effort. Because of the reduced capacity, it takes longer to reach the right altitude, and more space is required for takeoff. Taking off towards the ocean makes it easier to climb to a safe altitude without worrying about colliding with any obstacles. Another reason for airports being built at water level is that the higher up we go, the thinner the air becomes. It causes the thrust of the engines to decrease, as well as the lift produced by the wings. Setting off from higher areas means it's more difficult for the planes to take off. In terms of money, this would mean building longer runways, which would cost more, and no one wants that. This also means the planes require less fuel as they don't burn as much energy on takeoff. And there's less noise made as the planes don't have to work as hard. But despite this making the planes less noisy, airports are going to have pretty high noise levels. Imagine hearing planes zooming over your house while you're trying to get sleep at night. This is a key reason why airports are usually built on the coast far away from any residential areas, as fish aren't generally known to file noise complaints. In some countries, airports actually have to provide upgrades for nearby houses that will be affected by the noise. Germany is one of these countries, and they do everything from improving roofs to adding wall insulation to cover all that noise. Building by the coast means that they don't have to pay up for all these expensive upgrades, which saves the airport lots of cash. Coastal areas also have weather advantages for flying. Sea breezes are steady winds that blow from the water to the land. Planes mostly land and take off with the wind, making it the perfect place to build an airport as there'll be no delays caused by unexpected strong winds. But while the sea breezes that come in spring and summer are great, Areas near water can be prone to fog during fall and winter, so this part has its pros and cons. But not every airport is on the coast, as it does also pose a number of issues too. 
One of the biggest is birds. Our feathered friends love the coast because of all the yummy fish, but they can cause big problems for pilots. But airports manage to get around this using scare tactics. Birds don't really enjoy noise, and planes aren't the quietest of things. Airports also make loud bangs and even train hawks to take down birds that are in the way. The most obvious risk of building close to the sea, though, is flooding. Airports cost crazy amounts of money to build, and planes aren't cheap either. Back in 2018, Kansai Airport was flooded by Typhoon Jebi. They had to cancel all operations for two days, and the water was so high that it damaged the engines of the planes. While coastal airports put measures in place to protect against flooding, it's pretty difficult to save everything from a typhoon. With rising sea levels and an increase in extreme weather, these floodings are also looking more and more likely to happen. A quarter of the world's 100 busiest airports are less than 32 feet above sea level. And 12 of those, including New York, San Francisco, and Shanghai, are less than 16 feet. Yikes! All that water poses another problem. If planes overshoot the runway, they have nowhere to go. Overshooting is basically when the pilot underestimates the length of the runway and doesn't reach takeoff speed in time. There are usually extra bits of concrete or grass that the plane can run onto when the airports are on land. There'd be a bit of damage to the plane in this case, but nothing major. But with coastal airports, the plane might go straight into the water. Luckily, there's new tech that aims to prevent this from happening. These new kits let the pilots enter in all the flight calculations, including the weather conditions that could affect takeoff. This system then calculates how much runway the plane will need to stop. Many airports also have added soft concrete to the end of runways to avoid a watery disaster. When the plane glides onto this soft concrete, they get stuck and it stops them traveling too far. There are also financial issues with building airports next to the water. Land rent next to the coast or lakes is usually higher than the mainland due to the demand. Like 40% of the US population lives on the coast, despite coastal areas only making up around 10% of America's total landmass. Airports require flat land to be built on, but this isn't always easy to find, and coastal land can pose particular problems due to sand conditions on marshland. But this doesn't mean it's not possible. One of the world's most famous airports, New York's JFK, was built on marshland. The land was a lot cheaper than usual, and marshland can't really be used for a lot. Of course, it can cost a lot of money to make the ground suitable to carry heavy loads, but this was all sorted. Finding such a big area close to one of the world's most famous cities was a very rare find, even if it was marshland. It's your first trip to Egypt, and your new friends there invited you for lunch. The food seems a bit dull, so you decide to spice it up with salt and pepper. You don't see it on the table, so you ask the host for it, and you notice everyone's shocked. It turns out it's a huge insult to the cook when someone wants to change the original taste of the food on their plate. The cook made it that way for a reason. And wanting to spice it up means showing that the dish wasn't good enough. You're used to doing it as a kind gesture around the world. But don't tip waiters, taxi drivers, or hotel workers in Japan. They can get offended because they already get paid for providing you with good service. And there's no need for extra money to make it any better. If you really want to show appreciation, just say thank you. It's okay to tip private guides, tour companies, and interpreters. You can put any amount that feels right to you in an envelope and hand it down to them. If you want to impress your new Japanese friends or colleagues, take some time to study chopstick etiquette. When you master the art of holding chopsticks, remember not to rub them together. People do it to remove splinters, so it might look like you're unhappy with the quality of the pair that your host provided you with. Don't put your chopsticks vertically in your bowl of rice. This way, it can be seen as an offering to the deceased. Don't wave chopsticks in the air or use them to point at things. Both are considered really rude. The same is with moving things with your chopsticks or the hand holding them. It looks disrespectful. Plus, you're likely to spill things. When in Italy, 
don't order a cappuccino afternoon. The locals don't do it because they believe the milk and foam turn this drink into a meal and it's not good for digestion. Also, be prepared to enjoy your coffee standing at the bar and pay for it before you even order it. First, you pay the cash register, then show the receipt to the server to get your drink. Are you a big fan of chewing gum? Well, you'll have an uneasy time in Singapore. Using, selling and importing chewing gum is banned there and you'd have to pay up to several thousands of dollars for doing it. This law was introduced in the 1990s to make the city cleaner and keep the local fast trains up to schedule. When they launched a new transit system, passengers stuck gum onto train door sensors, causing some serious delays. With the new rules, this problem was solved. The no gum policy, along with many other strict rules, did help to make Singapore a really clean and fine city. Pun intended. If you absolutely can't imagine your life without chewing, the local authorities recommend replacing the gum with bananas. When someone asks you to pass them something, like salt, at the table in Bolivia, don't give it directly to them. Hand it to the person sitting next to them, and they'll pass it for you. If the person next to you is asking for that little favor, you still can't hand it straight to them. The person next to you will have to help. This table etiquette comes from a superstition that handing something to someone directly into their hands brings bad luck. For the same reasons, you can't reach across the table or stand up to pass something or toss it to someone. And don't forget to keep both hands on the table when you aren't eating. It might look like you're trying to hide something if your hands aren't visible at all times. When you arrive for a meal in Jordan, the hosts may give you some bitter Arabic coffee as a warm welcome. Don't try to stretch it for the rest of the evening. The polite thing to do is empty it fast. Only when everyone's done with the drink do people go back to socializing. As you pass the empty cup to the hosts, make sure to jiggle your wrists. If you just pass it without jiggling, it will mean you're asking for a refill. Don't rush to arrive at an event on time in Venezuela. People might think that you're rude or greedy. The polite thing to do is to be 10 to 15 minutes late. Events scheduled for 7 o'clock will often begin at 8 o'clock or later. A popular story goes that in the 1980s, a foreign reporter arrived at a press event more than an hour late. When he saw the room was mostly empty, he went to apologize to the host for missing the event. The host then told him he was the first reporter to arrive. It's quite interesting because the clocks in this country have officially been 0.9 seconds ahead of the rest of the world for years. Are you planning to travel by bus in Ireland anytime soon? Don't forget to thank the driver for the ride on your way out of the bus. You'll hear an overwhelming majority of locals do it loudly as it's basically not optional. Choose the gift wisely if you've been invited to a home in Vietnam. It's okay to bring fruit, sweets or incense. Handkerchiefs are believed to be a symbol of a sad farewell and cutting tools are a sign of cutting relationships. So don't bring those. Wrap your gift in colorful paper and don't opt for black. The locals believe this color to be a bad omen. When you present the gift, hold it with both hands. And don't be surprised if the hosts don't open it right away. It's done after the giver has left. Don't leave anything on your plate in India. It's a sign of disrespect for the food you were served. Food is considered sacred in the country, so it would upset your hosts a lot. So, wash and dry your hands before starting the meal. Don't forget to praise the cook and wait for the eldest to stand up before you leave the table. In South India, it's common to serve food on a banana leaf. You gotta fold it over from the top when you're done with the meal. Folding it from the bottom means you weren't satisfied with what you got. It might be a good conversation starter elsewhere, but don't brag about your achievements in Denmark. The locals believe that everyone is equal. So you won't hear them talk about their successful careers or talents or how special they are. And they expect the same from you. If you're looking for a good topic, they'll gladly talk to you about the greatness of their country. The Danes are really proud of it and all its wonders. If you're going on a trip to Germany, and plan to drive on the famous Autobahn. Make sure to tank up before you hit the road. 
Stopping, parking, making U-turns, and backing up on this super speedy highway is illegal. Yes, even if you have to stop because you've run out of gas, you'll have to pay a fine since you were supposed to plan things better. And although the Autobahn technically doesn't have a speed limit, watch out if you're passing by urban areas like Frankfurt, Berlin, and Munich, or construction works and heavy traffic. There will be special speed instructions for these spots. In case you're planning to explore Cyprus by car, quench your thirst before you start the vehicle. Drinking anything, including water, isn't allowed while driving on the island. So if you can't resist snacking or drinking behind the wheel, prepare to pay a fine. In Ethiopia, you gotta think twice before choosing a gift for someone. They see it as a debt they'll have to repay in the future. So if you bring something really expensive, the receiver will either have to spend a lot of money on a return gift or feel indebted to you. Now, flying has long become routine for many people. But even frequent flyers sometimes don't know about things you should never do on a plane. Ooh. No bare feet on a plane. It's one of the biggest no-nos of air travel. Even if we omit the topic of unpleasant odors. Phew. The airplane floor is extremely filthy. People with contagious foot problems might have been walking the aisles barefoot before you. There's likely to be a lot of dirt left after previous passengers. And don't even get me started on the floor in the laboratories. Ew. If your feet need some freedom, take off your shoes, but at least wear your socks. Or bring along a pair of light slippers. Keep in mind that the pressurized air in the passenger cabin is just as dry as it is in the Sahara Desert, with only about 20% humidity. That's why your skin may feel discomfort after a flight. Mm. But wouldn't it make more sense to install several humidifiers that could add some moisture? But this extra load would cost airlines lots of money. Plus, the plane's airframe is mostly made of aluminum and other metals, and humid air could lead to corrosion. So, don't forget to bring a moisturizer and use it during the flight. Always secure your tray table as soon as the plane starts moving on the tarmac, and never lower it during the takeoff and landing. It's a security measure, which ensures that you and the other passengers will have a clear pathway in case of an emergency evacuation. Also, keep your seat in an upright position during takeoff and landing. First of all, a reclined seat can seriously slow down an emergency evacuation, since it will block a person sitting behind. What's more, the more backward you're leaning, the harder it is to get into the brace position during an emergency landing. Now try to avoid snoozing during or right after takeoff and landing. For one thing, it's not the best thing for your health. The main problem is that the air pressure inside the cabin changes very quickly during these phases of the flight. This, in turn, affects the air pressure in your ears. It's important to be alert during this time to relax and open up your ears. For example, by yawning or swallowing frequency. Chewing gum works for me. If you're sleeping, you can't do this, which can lead to permanent damage. And of course, there's a safety issue. Most accidents happen during takeoff and landing. If you're sleeping during these stages, you might not be alert and conscious enough if an emergency happens. Now, this next recommendation comes from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. According to them, you might want to skip on hot drinks on a plane. The water used to make tea or coffee doesn't come from bottles. It's regular tap water. And water tanks on airplanes are often old and full of bacteria. In 2004, there was a study which found that more than 12% of water samples contained harmful bacteria. But if you still decide to have a cup of hot beverage on a plane, never pour coffee or tea on your own. Flight attendants are trained to handle this task in crowded aisles of a moving airplane and won't accidentally burn you or other passengers. Now, it's probably better if you don't order Coke on a plane. The cabin pressure so low up in the air causes a lot of foam. For apparent reasons, flight attendants don't want to serve you a cup filled with froth. That's why they'll fill only half the cup, then wait for the bubbles to settle, and then finish pouring. That can take ages. Keep your air vent open. This way, you'll minimize the spread of germs. Planes have high-quality air filters. 
they'll catch up to 99% of all airborne germs, so you should be safe there. But make sure to wipe that tray table. With 8 times more bacteria than the toilet flush button, it's the dirtiest place on board. Another thing you should avoid is leaning your head on the window if you have a window seat. You never know who occupied your seat before you, and in any case, the glass is likely to be covered with germs. Say no to backless sandals and high heels on a flight. I do. There are very serious safety reasons for such a request. The first is that both these types of footwear make it very difficult to evacuate the aircraft fast. If you wear high heels, you will anyway have to leave them behind in case the crew is using emergency slides during an evacuation. The heels are very likely to damage the slide, so off they go. Now ask yourself, do you really fancy running away from the airplane barefoot? I'll answer that for you, nope. Instead, wear sturdy shoes with a solid sole. In this case, you won't find yourself standing on the hot tarmac or in the weeds without any footwear at all. Don't stuff heavy objects into overhead compartments. Your things may not stay inside during severe turbulence. And while falling out, they will injure you and other passengers. Ow! That's why if it feels difficult to lift something into the overhead compartment, better put it under the seat in front of you or elsewhere. Now, don't blame the pilot for the hard landing. When you experience it in bad weather, it might be intentional. If the runway is covered with water or snow, the plane has to touch down hard in order to break the water layer and prevent aquaplaning. Otherwise, the water can perform the role of a lubricant, and the plane won't be able to break or respond to any control. Deploying an emergency slide when there's no emergency is a bad, very bad idea. It can cause hour-long delays and cost airlines thousands of dollars to pack the undamaged slide back into its container. Why would someone do it? Apparently, some think it'll help them get off the plane faster. Well, they're an idiot. Don't be one yourself. Just keep in mind that it doesn't work this way. Don't ignore the instructions of the cabin crew to open window shades during takeoff and landing. This way, flight attendants can see what's happening outside, assess the situation, and act fast, organizing the evacuation. For example, if there's a fire outside one exit, they will redirect passengers toward another door. Avoid carrying spray deodorants or shaving cream in your carry-on baggage. Both these things tend to explode mid-flight and, therefore, aren't allowed on board the airplane. A much better idea is to choose stick deodorants. You also mustn't keep power banks in your checked luggage. And if you want to bring one on board, its capacity shouldn't be more than 20,000 milliamps. Besides, you shouldn't use them during the flight since they might catch fire. In general, lithium batteries are safe to use. But since they're high energy, they can catch fire if they're not treated with care, misused, or if there's a manufacturing fault. Such batteries have been the cause of quite a few fires on board airplanes, as well as during ground handling. Do not worry about airport scanners. They won't harm your health. Otherwise, airport employees wouldn't be able to stay near them without special clothing. Even when you're passing by a baggage scanner, the risk is minimal. And the last one. Don't act like a jerk on board. Behave yourself. I know you will. Also, never try to land a plane on your own. Nah, don't laugh. I'm not kidding. In movies, they often show us that something happens to the pilots and they can't land the plane. And that's when the main character, a very skillful person, starts their game. Unfortunately, it's close to impossible to do it in real life. Even if a person is a genius, is fond of computer simulators that match the real model of an aircraft 100%, and is ready to follow all the instructions from the ground, they're likely to fail due to one simple aspect – stress. It is true that there have been cases throughout history when amateurs landed smallish private planes after the incapacitation of a pilot. However, there has never been a case of a non-professional pilot landing a commercial passenger airplane. It's only in the movies. You check into your hotel room, connect to Wi-Fi, jump on the bed, and post 15 photos of your new window view. When the initial surge of excitement is gone, you notice a suspicious blinking light on your big TV. Could it be that someone is watching you? Or have you just seen too many spy movies? Well. Hidden cameras come in all shapes and sizes. Large ones are easy to spot, but the small ones can be really sneaky and inconspicuous. 
They can be hiding behind furniture, in decorations or vents, and anywhere else you'll have trouble noticing. There are even special cameras that can be hidden in everyday movable objects like alarm clocks, picture frames, vases, and lamps. Check to see if these objects are facing at a strange angle or if they're positioned to get the best view of your room or bathroom. The easiest way to spot a hidden cam is to look for the lens reflection because all cameras come with lenses. Turn off the lights and slowly scan the room with a flashlight, laser pointer, or a special wireless spy cam detector. It comes with infrared scanning lights and one illuminating light. When you find a reflective red spot, you gotta turn on the flashlight to help check if there is a hidden camera. Definitely check the vents along with any other holes and gaps in the walls or ceiling. Some advanced detectors even show you what the camera is seeing, making it way easier to spot and disable. The detectors only work on cameras that are turned on and working normally though. Your mobile phone can also help you find some hidden threats. Turn on Bluetooth and walk around, see if any unknown devices pop up on the screen. Another idea is to install a network scanner app that shows all devices that are connected to the Wi-Fi network you're using at the hotel. When it's done scanning, study the list for devices called something like IP camera or cam. Plus, you can put your phone on selfie mode, turn off the light and close the curtains and look around the room slowly while focusing on the screen. Keep an eye out for purple or white lights on the screen. You can play detective some more and call your friend or family member and start walking around your room. Secret cameras should emit a sort of radio frequency. It will most likely interfere with your phone call signal. If you start hearing any weird noises while you're on the phone in a certain area of your room, make sure to inspect it carefully. Check out the light switches, electrical outlets, lamps, and other objects you normally wouldn't pay attention to. If they look a bit crooked, have a hole, or seem misplaced, it could be a sign that someone tampered with them. Many spy devices need wires, and whoever installed them had to hide those wires, often behind the vinyl baseboard. That's why the place where the floor and the wall meet is another area you should check. Ridges, bumps, or discoloration could be a sign there's a microphone hiding there. The same goes for spots on ceilings and walls even if they're not larger than a coin. If you do find a hidden camera or something looking suspicious, don't shy away and let the hotel administration or your booking service know about it. Don't try to touch or move the device yourself. If the hotel denies everything, contact local law enforcement. After you've scanned the room for cameras, check out the mirrors. Someone could be watching you from the other side. First, see if the mirror is built into the wall or can be adjusted. If the mirror is semi-transparent, it will be built into the wall. You can do a simple test to check the mirror. Press your fingertip against the glass and push firmly enough to leave a fingerprint as you move your finger away. Study the fingerprint. If there is a small gap between the print and the mirror where the glass should be, then it's just a mirror. On a semi-transparent mirror, there will be no gap. Another way to check if your mirror is semi-transparent is simply to tap the glass. If someone is watching you from the other side, the mirror will make an empty sound. A double mirror needs a brighter light on the other side than on yours. Get close to it and cup your hands around your eyes. Do you see some light behind the mirror? If so, you might have an unwanted audience. Before you leave your room or go to bed, make sure every door is securely locked. By every door, I mean not only the entrance to the room, but also the door leading to the terrace, if you have one. You can bring a portable door lock with you for extra security if you're staying in. You could also start a little DIY project and wrap a belt or a bag strap around the arm that pushes the door shut. Buckle it up and wrap it around several times for an extra layer of protection. Another idea for when you're about to nap or go to sleep is to build a pyramid of stuff by the door. Glasses and mugs will do perfectly. 
If someone tries to get inside while you're sleeping, there'll be some serious noise. Intruders prefer to keep it low-key, so they're highly likely to give up on robbing you straight away. If you travel with some valuables and don't feel comfortable leaving them around the room, you could put them in the safe inside your room. But because those safes use passcodes instead of physical locks, someone from the hotel has to know the master code to unlock it, just in case. So, you can bring your own safe with you instead. You can find the ones looking like books on Amazon, for example. They're made of strong metal and textured paper. They come with a combination lock and have enough room to fit your passports, cash, and jewelry. In case you have to leave your laptop in the room and want to make sure no one plugs in a USB drive to steal your data, here's what you can do. Leave a bottle of water or some other item next to the USB port. Measure the distance. Let's say it's one thumb length away. For someone to plug in their device in the laptop, they need to move the bottle. You can take it one step further and drop a pen parallel to the laptop under a certain angle. You can measure the angle with your smartwatch or phone using the Compass app. Again, if someone moves it, you'll know. Even something as simple as a please do not disturb sign can help you figure out if someone entered your room while you were away. Make it look like you left in a rush and the sign accidentally stuck between the door and the door frame. If you come back and the sign is hanging freely, then someone must have ignored it and tried to disturb you. In that case, you can contact reception and ask to send someone to enter the room with you to keep you safe. If you care about the cleanliness of your room as much as you do about your belongings and your personal safety, this one's for you. Hotel housekeeping workers normally have up to 20 rooms to take care of on an 8-hour shift. It means they'll have no more than 30 minutes for your room. It gives them enough time to make the bed, clean the floors in the room and the bathroom, empty the trash bins, and dust all surfaces. But they rarely have the time to take care of smaller objects like light switches, door and drawer handles, and remotes. And yes, these are exactly the objects you'll be in contact with the most. They can actually have more germs than the toilet. So if you want to be sure those germs won't land on your hands, bring enough antibacterial wipes to clean all those things before you touch them. Are the letters SSSS on your boarding pass a reason to worry? What's much more dangerous than turbulence? Should you really be the first to board the plane? You're about to figure it out. You might have noticed that most planes have blue seats. There's no mystery here. Airlines opt for this color because it's considered to have a calming effect. This color supposedly puts passengers at ease and helps even the most nervous flyers to relax. But there's also another, more practical reason. Stains, dirt, and scrapes are less visible on dark blue fabric. Never throw your boarding pass away in a public place. It contains tons of your sensitive information, including your name and frequent flyer number. This, in turn, may allow someone else to check your future bookings, change your seat, or even cancel your flights. So the best way to deal with the boarding pass for a flight you've already boarded is to take it home and feed it through a paper shredder. By the way, if you ever see the letters SSSS or S on your boarding pass, get ready for additional security checks. Instead of these letters, there may be a checkerboard pattern. Anyway, if you have any of these marks, your carry-on luggage can also undergo a thorough inspection. Why might they choose you for secondary screening? Some of the criteria are making a one-way reservation or paying cash for your ticket. In some cases, the selection is absolutely random. Look, your gate is open and the boarding is started. Wait, where are you running? There's no need to hurry. The trick experienced globetrotters use is always board last. For one thing, you don't have to waste time standing in line. Then, there are fewer people on the jetway and in the aisle and you spend less time on the plane. No one is going to take your seat anyway. There's one exception though. If you have a bulky carry-on bag, it may make more sense not to board last. 
Otherwise, the chances are high that all the overhead bin space will be occupied by the time you reach your seat. And then your bag may end up in another part of the plane, and you'll have to wait till the other passengers disembark before you get to your luggage. Duh! Before takeoff and landing, flight attendants usually flip a small switch on the bathroom door. This prevents it from flying open when it's not supposed to. With the same ease, a flight attendant can open the door when someone is inside. Look, they only need to lift the lavatory sign and move the knob into the unlocked position. Pilots don't worry about turbulence. That's because they know that there is a thing way more dangerous than any turbulence. It's an updraft. In most cases, turbulence only drops you a couple of feet down, even though it might feel as if you're falling from the top of the Empire State Building. If the turbulence is strong enough for the pilots to ask flight attendants to sit down, the plane can go 10 to 20 feet down. The most extreme white-knuckle turbulence is super rare. But an updraft is a big air mass, part of a storm or some other weather phenomenon, moving upwards. Pilots don't see updrafts on their radars at night, and when a plane hits one, it feels like driving over a huge speed bump at 500 miles per hour. An updraft is also extremely treacherous because it can push an aircraft upward to dangerous altitudes. Modern planes have a special system that detects other aircraft, mountains, and different solid objects in their path. Ten miles away from another plane, and a voice in the cockpit starts chanting, Traffic! Traffic! Five miles closer, and the same voice begins to give pilots the directions. Airplanes can operate with one engine, even during takeoff and landing. Both engines failing simultaneously is almost unheard of. But even then, a plane wouldn't drop from the sky like a rock. Pilots would have up to 20 minutes to find a suitable place to land. The way the cabin is pressurized has a great effect on your taste buds. You lose up to 30% of your ability to taste sweet and salty things. In other words, it's not that airplane food isn't tasty, you just don't feel its flavor. That's also the main reason why airline catering companies add extra salt and spices to the dishes they cook. But you know what may help you? Noise-canceling earphones. For some reason, that probably has a scientific explanation. Cutting off all that noise around can help your taste buds. Each of those dings you hear during the flight has its own meaning. In most airlines, a Boeing soon after takeoff indicates that the landing gear is getting retracted. Three dings in a row means more urgency than just one. A high-low ringtone informs crew members that their colleague needs them in another part of the plane. Three low chimes means some serious turbulence ahead. Crew members are supposed to put away meal carts, take their seats, and fasten their seatbelts. If you're a nervous flyer, pick a seat in the middle of the cabin. Turbulence mostly affects the front and rear parts of the cabin. The middle section, which is over the wings, doesn't shake so much. Pilots and co-pilots eat different meals. The reason for this precaution is very simple. Imagine both pilots having the same dish and getting food poisoning. In this case, neither of them will be able to control the plane. If they still want to have the same dish and won't agree to have anything else, there is a safety net. Pilots don't have their meals at the same time. If one pilot ate the dish and still feels okay several hours later, the other pilot can brave their meal as well. What would you say when asked about the filthiest place on a plane? Nope, that's not the toilet seat. It's not even in the bathroom. Flight attendants warn that you should be particularly careful with headrests, seat pockets, tray tables, and seat belts. Experiments have shown that one-third of all seat belts have yeast and mold on them. Most tray tables are covered with bacteria. Seat pockets are extremely filthy too, but headrests are the dirtiest of them all. In most cases, flight attendants don't have enough time to change or disinfect them in between flights. If your captain announces they're finishing some paperwork, it means they're busy revising the flight itinerary or waiting for the ground staff to prepare the flight logbook. That's a journal that contains the official record of a journey. Some places, especially those flying long distances, have secret bedrooms for crew members to catch them shut-eye. These bedrooms, 
called crew rest compartments, are located either at the back of the plane or behind the cockpit. Such a compartment can have up to 10 comfortable beds where flight attendants can have a rest. Plane windows are made of super strong plexiglass that can easily cope with high speeds. And the window panes are shaped in a special way so that the high pressure inside the cabin pushes them against the aircraft body. In other words, plane windows are very unlikely to get broken. Once upon a time, plane windows were square, but the pressure built up in the corners of such windows, making them ultimate weak spots. This means that each square window had four weak spots. This made them likely to crash under the enormous stress of high altitudes. Luckily, making airplane windows curved solved this problem once and forever. Such a shape distributes the pressure and reduces the likelihood of cracks or any other damage. Planes regularly get struck by lightning at least once a year or once per 1,000 hours of flight time. These days, it's totally safe. The electric charge simply runs through the aircraft's aluminum shell. It doesn't cause the plane any damage. But did you know that airplanes not only get hit by lightning, but they also trigger it? When an aircraft is flying through a cloud, the friction between its fuselage and the air creates static electricity. Sometimes, it can cause lightning. Ah yes, everyone loves a holiday. But figuring out what to pack in your luggage can be a daunting task, especially when you're limited on weight and baggage space. Not to mention you're likely to do some holiday shopping on your adventure away from home. So, you're going to need extra space on your return for all those souvenirs you've collected. Accumulating too much weight or bulk can end up costing you a handsome fee with the airline if you're not properly prepared. But you can now relax. You just focus on booking your vacation. We'll take care of your luggage with these handy traveling tips. No doubt your clothes are going to take up the bulk of your luggage. Considering most airline standards permit one bag for most local trips and up to two bags for longer distances, that doesn't grant you a whole lot of space if you plan on being fashionable on your getaway, especially in the winter. However, this doesn't mean you have to turn your undergarments inside out for repeated use. The key here is to be clever with how you pack. Firstly, you might want to consider how you're folding your clothes. The most space-efficient method to store your wardrobe in a suitcase for travel is to roll up each item. Think of your clothes like those sleeping bags you used to take on your camping trips. They always seem too thick for their compacted covers, but with perseverance, you could roll it up tight enough to fit inside. Now, you don't need to wrestle with your clothes quite as much, but the same principle here applies. Start by folding your shirts, pants, and whatever else you plan on packing neatly, similar to how you might find them on a clothing store shelf. Then, when you have them in a relatively rectangular or squared off shape, roll them up tightly. Now that you have your little clothes logs, start packing them into your bag. And behold, extra space. Now, here's something we've all experienced arriving at our holiday destination. We drop our suitcase on the hotel bed, open it up, only to find all our clothes unfurled and scattered like a tornado stormed through our bag. Your luggage has had a rough journey from your home to your holiday destination. It's been dragged through airport terminals, tossed around by baggage handlers, and rocked back and forth during in-flight turbulence. A simple stationary item, rubber bands, will help you keep your clothes neat. Now that you've got them rolled up, place a couple of rubber bands around them to keep them from unfurling. This is an especially neat trick if you want to roll an outfit together as one. Maybe you've got head-to-toe denim that you can't wait to rock on your getaway. Fold up your clothes as before, then layer the different items of your ideal outfit atop each other. Roll them up as one, then use the rubber bands to keep them together. You can preemptively decide your day-to-day -day outfits before you even board the plane. However, you may still prefer to fold your clothes, especially business or formal shirts and pants. Lucky for you, we have a handy trick for that, too. Instead of folding each item individually, we're going to lay it out all on top of each other. Start with your shirts and tops, alternating with one on top and one on the bottom, keeping the necks of your shirts at the center. Work your way down to your pants and smaller items until they're all laid out flat. Try to keep your pants in the middle. Finally, 
start folding your items in on themselves, with the shirts creating the outer layer, until you end up with a neat bundle, like a present. You should be able to sit your bundle squarely into your bag. Want to save even more luggage space? Instead of putting your undergarments and socks into their own section, try fitting them into available spaces and gaps within the rest of your luggage. If you plan on taking a cap with you, for instance, the inside of your headwear is a great space to store your socks. This applies to other small luggage items too, such as phone chargers and ties. Though keep in mind that you can also lay your ties and belts out flat across the clothes in your luggage to conserve space. And if you're really limited on baggage size, say all you have is a carry-on for a fortnight long trip, here's another method. Get yourself some compression bags to store your clothes in. These bags will compact multiple sets of clothes into the size of a small laptop bag. Fold up the clothes you intend to pack and store them into the compression bag. You should be able to fit 8 to 10 standard clothes items or a few bulky ones. Once you've filled the bag, seal it and squeeze the air out through the built-in one-way pressure valve. The easiest way to do this is either by rolling it, and you should be pretty good at rolling your clothes by now, or by using your knees to apply pressure. You should be able to fit two to four of these compression bags in your standard carry-on suitcase, which is especially helpful if you want to save money by avoiding checked-in luggage. And you can take even more clothes on board with you if you stick them into a pillowcase. The best thing about this tip is that it also doubles as a comfy pillow for you to rest your head on during the flight. If you do have a bit more space to spare, another great way to keep your stuff organized is with packing cubes. It might not be as space efficient as compression bags, but a lot of travelers prefer them for tidier and well-organized packing. You might like to divide them by outfits or clothes types, such as one for pants and one for tops. You can easily purchase packing cubes from most online retail services and travel and camping stores. There are also packing cubes specially designed for one or more pairs of shoes. This is a great way to compact the space your shoes would otherwise take up in your luggage and to keep your clean clothes from coming into contact with your footwear. Nobody wants their tops to smell like feet, right? If you're still struggling to bring all your items with you inside your suitcase, there are a couple more tricks that you can use for that extra bit of weight without the extra cost. The most obvious of which is to use your own body. <laughs> That's right, time to layer up. Pick out all your bulky items and wear as many as you can manage. You can try wearing some shorts under your pants or several layers of your winter wear, such as your sweater, jacket, and coat all over the top of one another. You might be sweating a little, but most airports and planes are well air conditioned. You can always shed some layers once you've boarded your flight. At least you'll have some warm wear to snuggle up in if you do get cold up there in the clouds. If you don't want to wear all those layers, there's actually another type of bag you can carry on the plane with you, free of charge. Get yourself a duty-free bag from any of the duty-free stores in the airport. You can even hang on to it for next time. Store all your extra items in your duty-free bag and carry it onto your flight at no additional cost. It's also worth considering what type of luggage you're using. More importantly, how much it weighs. A lot of people forget that the standard 15 pounds permitted by most airlines includes the actual weight of their suitcase. The bag itself can often weigh up to 4 to 6 pounds. That's a huge chunk of your weight in the bag alone. So, when you're shopping for your luggage, take into account how much it weighs. Choosing a lighter bag will give you more space for the items you want to take with you. Stick to some of these handy tips and you'll be on your way with no shortage of luggage and some extra money to spend on your vacation. Happy flying! Airports are some of the most visited and, at the same time, mysterious places out there. So, let's see what's going on behind the scenes and what secrets airports hide. At some airports, there are special people called profilers. Such people bring to life a special program called SPOT, Screening Passengers by Observation Technique. They analyze your mimics, gestures, and behavior in order to detect suspicious people. Their job is to notice nonverbal signs of anxiety, people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in an unusual way, they can invite them for an inspection. There, they talk to this person trying to find out more about them and confirm, or not, their suspicions. 
airport agents might also be watching you all the way from the security check to your gate. Some airports have facial recognition scanners that can easily track you. They're equipped with special software that compares passengers' faces with their IDs. Keep in mind that if you don't charge your laptop before the flight, it may be confiscated. It's not uncommon for an airport security officer to ask you to power your device up. If you fail to do it, your gadget can be taken away for an additional check. For safety reasons, it's crucial to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with or modified in a way that can cause harm during the flight. Packing an electric brush in your check-in luggage may land you in trouble. Brushes produced by some brands have lithium batteries inside, and those can potentially lead to serious problems in the air. That's why leaving your electric brush in your check suitcase isn't an option. But you're allowed to store them in your carry-on bag. At the same time, if your device runs on AA batteries, you can put it wherever you want. Anyone who's ever traveled by plane knows about the no liquids rule, but not everybody knows that this rule also applies to peanut butter, toothpaste, creams, lotions, liquid makeup, lava lamps, snow globes, some kinds of medications, deodorant, and even gel shoe inserts. Now, let's go outside for a while and look at those landing spots. Airports charge airline companies huge fees for landing on their runways on certain days and at particular times. But the most interesting thing is that the landing spots can be bought and sold. For example, in 2016, Oman Air paid Air France around $75 million for one early morning arrival slot at London Heathrow Airport. You must have noticed that airfare has increased over the past decade. That's because of the extremely high prices of landing slots. Dispatchers don't only control the planes in the sky, as you can often see in the movies, but they also look after their movements on the ground. They also control the lighting on the runways. There's three types of air traffic controllers, en route, terminal, and tower. Each of these dispatchers has their own area of responsibility. One dispatcher has about five monitors, and the information on them is constantly changing since the monitors show weather conditions and information about other planes. You know how it sometimes goes. You come to a security checkpoint, and all of a sudden, it turns out you have something prohibited in your carry-on. But worry not, you still have a chance to save your favorite pen knife. At some airports, there are on-site postal services, and you might have an opportunity to mail your belongings to any address you provide. But the mailing fees are pretty high. Plus, certain items are prohibited, and the postal service won't deliver them. Airports can be selling your lost luggage right now. Of course, I don't say that there's no chance for you to get back your suitcases that's traveled to a different destination, but just as likely, you might not see it again. In this case, an airport has the right to sell your misplaced belongings at an auction. Most airports have an annual lost luggage sale. After paying an entry fee, you can bid on electronics, clothes, bags, and other stuff. While flying, you might have a celebrity on board, but you won't know it. Large airports have separate check-in and security procedures for celebrities. They often board the plane directly through a hidden door located beside the jet bridge. Some airlines also use cool cars to transfer VIP passengers from the terminal building to the plane. At the same time, most people come to the airport well ahead of time. And the most popular activity while waiting for a flight is wandering through the duty-free zone. And even though people rarely plan to buy anything there, different products end up in their shopping baskets. That's because lots of airports are designed in a special way that makes people feel relaxed and at ease. I'm talking about all those huge windows, a lot of light, massage chairs, and comfortable seating areas. And statistically, calm passengers are 10% more likely to spend money on retail, duty-free, and food. Designers put a lot of thought into airport layouts. It helps to ensure the smooth flow of travelers. And the main point here is easy navigation that can prevent people from getting lost. This is achieved through subtle but very effective design cues. 
and placing duty-free zones between security checkpoints and boarding gates is one of them. They supposedly help you relax after clearing security and lead you where you need to go. But speaking of food, a celebrity chef restaurant at the airport might not be as good as it would be if you were visiting the real thing. Not chefs themselves, but special restaurant companies are responsible for airport outlets. One of the reasons is the extremely strict security that surrounds airport deliveries, including food. You may still have a nice meal, but it won't be the same. Now, I'll tell you about one more way airports manipulate you into spending your money. They make you walk through the shiny duty-free stores straight after the security check. But the most curious thing is that the walkway through such stores usually veers to the left. That's done because most people are right-handed, which means they use their right arm to pull their luggage and are more likely to look to the right while passing through the stores. And the duty-free zone veering to the left leaves more space on the right where passengers are more likely to look. Oh, and have you ever noticed how many mirrors there are at airports? Mirrors are strategically placed there to make airports appear larger and create an illusion of more space. This in turn helps to reduce the feeling of claustrophobia and makes the airport experience more comfortable for travelers. If you have an opportunity, don't exchange cash at the airport. You'll never get a good rate there. Those who didn't buy local currency in advance can instead order it online and collect it at the airport. Some services only need a few hours' notice for such an order, or it might even be better to use an ATM to withdraw some cash at your final destination. Now, have you ever paid attention to airport codes? The most often used are three-letter codes. Why this number? Back in the 1930s in the USA, pilots used the National Weather Service's two-letter city codes to refer to airports. But soon, the number of airports in the country outgrew the number of such codes. That's why airlines expanded this system by adding the third letter. It was usually X. That's how LA, Los Angeles, turned into LAX. But even though there shouldn't be two airports with the same code, some of these codes sound so similar you could easily mistake one for the other. For example, look at this airport with the code CGP in Bangladesh. And here we have CPG. It's the code of an airport in Argentina. It's dangerously easy to fly to the wrong place. So pay attention. Most airports are equipped with giant kitchens where the food for passengers is prepared for different airlines at once. Since those oh-so-delightful airplane meals must be cooked about 6 to 10 hours prior to the flight, the kitchens have to work 24-7. Besides, the menu for your flight is developed up to a year in advance. This is a common practice for most airlines, because every single ingredient matters and adds to expenses. In fact, American Airlines managed to save $40,000 per year in 1987 after they removed just one olive from every salad they served on their flights. If you have a long layover between flights, going to the nearest hotel to rest might not be the cheapest option there's a much better trick. Check if the airport or airline sells 24-hour access to the VIP lounge zone. In most cases, you can have free snacks and drinks there and use free shower cabins and rooms for rest at a very affordable price. There's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you check in, the golden hour. It's the time that passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Sitting in a comfy chair while looking at a flashy sign or shopping window can be tempting. If you ever wanted to know what happens to your baggage while you're on board a plane, the short answer is that airport staff don't know once it leaves their territory. And they probably don't really care. Sorry. Baggage is sorted automatically. Scanners scan the barcode and sort the baggage according to its destination. The three main tasks of airport baggage handlers are to move your bags from the check-in area to the gate, to move them from one gate to another when you have a connection, and to move your bags from the plane to the baggage claim area. And that's it! So, if your baggage doesn't move fast enough, it can be late for your connecting flight. 
or the exact opposite. Your bag gets to your destination before you do because you're stuck at passport control. Another problem can arise if you forget to tear off any old stickers showing a different destination. In this case, the scanner might send your baggage to the wrong country. You arrive at the airport, already anticipating a couple weeks away from work and all your daily troubles. Park your car in the lot and then find out that it's going to cost you a small fortune to leave your car there. Why so much? In fact, airport parking lots are a business just like any other. The land on which they're built, the construction of the lot itself, the maintenance of the whole thing once it's already in operation, all that costs a handsome amount of money. And somebody's got to pay for it, of course. In addition, parking right next to an airport is simply convenient, which adds to the final cost. If you're not ready to dip into your pocket for a piece of extra comfort, better take a cab. Contrails. Those white trails airplanes often leave behind them at high altitudes are easily mistaken for engine exhaust. But most are nothing more than water vapor. During a flight, moisture in the air collects in the engines before being vented with the exhaust. The hot, wet air leaving the engines mixes with the cool, dry air found at high altitudes, resulting in long, thin lines of vapor. Humidity determines when contrails form and how long they remain visible. If it's already humid up there, then there's more water and the contrail is more prominent. And if it's cold, the droplets might turn into ice, staying behind for a much longer time. If someone were able to open the door mid-flight, they would be immediately pulled out of the plane by a sudden change in air pressure. It could also do serious harm to the aircraft. Fortunately, that's almost impossible. The doors on an airliner open inward while the cabin pressure pushes them out from the inside. The difference between internal and external pressure makes it impossible for the door to open. It might seem odd that the flight crew cares whether your window shades are up or down. The main reason is so that the passenger's eyes can adjust to the outside light. Mostly, it's just a matter of getting people on and off quickly. But in an emergency, the last thing they want is people stopping to blink before they evacuate the plane. Another reason for all the shades to stay up when the airplane is about to take off or land is for the ground crew to see if there's any trouble on board. For example, if there's a fire in the cabin, the ground crew will immediately notice it and act accordingly. If the shades are down, they might lose precious time they would need to rescue the passengers and the airplane crew. Ever notice the numbers on the end of the runway? They're actually used to show the pilot which direction the plane is facing. For example, the number 36 is short for a heading of 360 degrees, or due north. Along with numbers, the letters R and L indicate if the nearest runway is to the right or left. Every commercial airplane you've been on has only one wing. That's right, the left and right wings are actually two parts of a single wing. The first airplanes were called biplanes because they had two wings, one on the top and the other going through the bottom of the fuselage. They were connected with struts and wires, which made a kind of box that basically allowed the aircraft not to fall apart in the air. It was necessary at lower speeds that early planes could only muster. But as the engines increased in power, the second wing became redundant. The single wing still serves as a support for the whole structure, though. Looking out the window on the plane's wing, you can see a small yellow double hook on it. It seems strange since it might mess with aerodynamics, but it's there for your safety. In case of an emergency landing, these hooks are used to secure ropes that help passengers exit the plane via the wings. If they're slippery, the rope will help you keep your footing and not fall over while going down. There are several extremely fast streams of air high up in the atmosphere of our planet. Their paths are meandering, but they have a more or less constant flow, allowing passenger aircraft to use them. When an airplane comes close to a jet stream, it may adjust to the direction of its current and fly a lot faster, propelled by the flow. Many airlines use this to their advantage to cut the fuel costs and make air traveling even faster. Clouds, especially thunderheads, can indicate that an area of turbulence is ahead. 
But sometimes, clear air turbulence occurs when a plane can drop a few feet and start shaking without any warning. It happens when two bodies of air clash at very high speeds. And it's absolutely invisible, so the pilots can't tell when it would happen. The chances of getting into an area of clear air turbulence are higher at low altitudes, over mountain ranges, and near the jet streams. Normally, after it's hit by lightning, an airplane is sent for inspection right after landing, but it can still safely complete its current flight. The fuselage conducts electricity well enough, and like with a lightning rod, the zap will most probably strike one of the tips of the airplane, either one of the wings or the nose. Then it seeks the ground, but doesn't find it, exiting from the tail in the end. It's easier for electricity to roll through the surface of the plane than go inside, so people on board are safe from its effects. Still, lightning is powerful, and there can be some damage done to the airplane on the outside. Many airports have carpets at their gate areas. This nicety usually comes with a few other perks. Lower ceilings, comfortable seats, and pleasant natural lighting. All this costs more for airports, and carpets are not so easy to clean as hard floors are. But they create a cozy feeling for passengers waiting for their flight, making them more relaxed. Still, it isn't a gesture of goodwill on the part of airports. According to social research, calm passengers are about 7-10% to more likely to go window shopping and actually buy something in the lounge area or duty-free zone. So, by investing in the passenger's comfort, airports actually increase their own income. If you ever wanted to know what happened to your baggage while you're on board a plane, the short answer is that airport staff don't actually know once it leaves their territory, and they probably really don't care. Sorry. Baggage is sorted automatically. Scanners scan the barcode and sort the baggage according to its destination. The three main tasks of airport baggage handlers are to move your bags from the check-in area to the gate, to move them from one gate to another when you have a connection, and to move your bags from the plane to the baggage claim area. And that's it. So if your luggage doesn't move fast enough, it can be late for your connecting flight, or the exact opposite. Your bag gets to your destination before you do because you're stuck at passport control. Another problem can arise if you forget to tear off any old stickers showing a different destination. In this case, the scanner might send your luggage to the wrong country. Most airports are equipped with giant kitchens where the food for passengers is prepared. These kitchens usually cook food for different airlines at once. And since that oh-so-delightful airplane food must be cooked for about 6 to 10 hours in advance, these kitchens have to work 24-7. And however surprising it might sound, the menu for your flight is developed up to a year in advance. This is a common practice for most airlines because every single ingredient matters and adds to expenses. In fact, one airline managed to save $40,000 after they removed just one olive from every salad they served on their flights. Airport staff sometimes ask passengers to rub their hands on a piece of cloth before putting it into a special machine. It might seem kind of scary, but it's actually harmless. You're simply being checked by a machine called an atomizer. Before their working day starts, employees put samples of dangerous chemicals into the machine. The machine memorizes these smells, and in case a person's hand smells like those chemicals, it alerts airport staff to this danger. You know how it sometimes goes. You come to the security checkpoint, and suddenly, it turns out you have something prohibited to take on board in your carry-on. But don't worry, all the things seized during the pre-flight inspection can be stored at the airport for as long as three months. On top of that, you have an opportunity to mail them any address inside the country. Things taken away by security and weren't claimed can also get sold at special auctions and are delivered worldwide. If you have a long layover between flights, going to the nearest hotel to rest might not be the cheapest option. There's a much better trick. Check if the airport or airline sells 24-hour access to the VIP lounge zone. In most cases, you can have free snacks and drinks there and use free shower cabins and rooms for rest at a very affordable price. In multi-terminal airports, search for underground passageways connecting terminals that most people might not know about. For example, at Frankfurt Airport in Germany, there's a walking tunnel between Terminal 1 and Terminal 2 that's mostly used by employees since passengers are simply unaware of its existence. There's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you clear check-in. 
The golden hour. It's the time that passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Let's admit, sitting in front of a comfy chair while looking at a flashy sign or shopping window can be tempting. And that's exactly what the airports want you to feel. If your flight is overbooked and you can't fly at the designated time, don't hurry to accept the first voucher you're offered as an apology. Normally, airlines keep raising the stakes until they have enough volunteers to give up their flight seats. And if they don't and you've been bumped in voluntarily, you can insist on a cash refund instead. Depending on your ticket price and the time of your delay, you might be entitled to as much as $1,300. Most airports have specific experts called profilers. These people practice what's called SPOT, or the Screening Passengers by Observation Technique. They carefully analyze facial expressions, gestures, and behavior in order to detect suspicious people. Their job is to notice the nonverbal signs of anxiety, such as people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in a weird or off way, they can invite them for an inspection, where they can talk to a person to find out more about them. Profilers work in both the main halls and in passport control. The typical question they ask is, what's the purpose of your visit? Then they check the person's reaction to this inquiry. No matter how reserved a passenger is, if they have something to hide, TSA officers will find out, thanks to the tiniest cues in people's behavior. Before your luggage even gets on the plane, it goes through five security levels, and one of them, besides scanning the contents, includes being checked by a special dog that can sniff out dangerous chemicals. It's a well-known fact that a dog's nose is much stronger than that of any human. In fact, dogs distinguish smells from 10,000 to 100,000 times better than people do. No wonder airports take advantage of this super sense for security and regularly use these sniffer dogs to detect suspicious substances. What's really cool is that you can't even distinguish a detection dog from its civilian siblings. Unlike police dogs, the ones working at airports aren't trained to frighten or intimidate people. The most popular sniffer breeds are Golden Retrievers, Labs, and German Short-Haired Pointers. Charging your phone at a specifically designated spot can look convenient, but it's not really safe. If the charging station only allows you to plug in your cord, you might get malware installed on your phone with you none the wiser. The only safe way to charge your phone or tablet is to find an electric socket and use it with your own charger. Same goes for free airport Wi-Fi. Apart from the airports requiring you to authenticate yourself more often than not, someone can easily access your data while you're using an unprotected Wi-Fi hotspot. It's safer to use your mobile data, but if you absolutely have to use the airport's Wi-Fi, best clear or encrypt all your important data on your device. It might be exasperating to take your laptop out of your carry-on at the security check every single time, but the airport staff need to have a clear look at your device to make sure nothing is concealed inside. On the screen of an x-ray scanner, a laptop looks like a semi-transparent object with a clearly visible hard drive, CD drive, and whatnot. But security officers can't see what's behind some of those parts. For example, a dense and rather large battery. People tend to choose the closest security line to them. If that line turns out to be super crowded, just look around after ID and ticket check. You may see another checkpoint with much fewer people. Some checkpoints at the airport are situated at the far edges of the terminal, and that's why passengers fail to notice them. Applying for a TSA pre-check can be a great time saver for traveling in and out of the U.S. Being a member of this program has some great perks. First, getting through security and passport control happens faster. If you're a pre-check traveler, you won't have to take off your shoes or remove your belt, and forget about placing your stuff like liquids and laptops in special bins. If you aren't flying to or from the U.S., then you can look up similar services available in your country. If you're flying economy class but don't like it, who does? Check in online and check out the seating options about four days before your flight. It's about that time that airlines typically start upgrading seats, and you might get an upgrade to business class for a small fee or even sometimes for free. You can also ask for an upgrade when you're already at the airport. Most people forget about this opportunity or simply don't care, so you might just get lucky. Hmm? Hey, you've got the right...
wrong person. I'm just a manager going back home from my annual vacation in Europe. The TSA agent pulls out a massive chunk of delicious French cheese from your hand luggage. Turns out, you can only grab really small amounts of soft cheese on board, since it's considered to be liquid. Fun fact, you can bring a cheese grater on board without any problems, but you can grate no more than 3.4 ounces. That's the maximum cheese amount. Wait, you can't grate it. Cheese should be safely sealed in a plastic bag. Good news, hard cheese is fine to travel with. Okay, they took your cheese. A large bottle of water, you're bad. Some cream tubes and other fancy souvenirs. Look at that fine Swiss knife you grabbed in Geneva. It now risks ending up in an auction. If you're lucky enough, the airport might provide a shipping service to get your precious souvenirs and even cheese, if it doesn't go bad, to your home for a fee. Still, not all the airports do this. So, some of the banned items will go to an auction to raise money. The confiscated items are usually sold in bulks, so it's going to be pretty hard to find the ones that you had to leave behind. Some other objects with more specific purposes are donated to different organizations. A uh, pepper spray, for instance, would go to a police training academy. As for cheese, prohibited exotic fruits, and other food and water, well, they usually just get disposed of. Some items, especially really bad and dangerous ones, may be simply melted or destroyed. Magic 8 balls pose no danger, but they have to be checked in luggage. The problem is the liquid inside them. Yeah, it might be less than 3.4 ounces, but let's face it, it's hard to count the exact amount. Ask your ball if you can take it on board. It's likely to give you a don't count on it answer. Relieving gel insoles are a bit disturbing on board. The problem is the same. It's impossible to count the exact amount of liquid. So no gel insoles and no gel candles either. Perfume and nail polish are kind of forbidden too. It's not only about liquid on board restrictions, but also about etiquette rules. Some passengers may simply be allergic to their smell. Plus, they're flammable. As for nail polish removers, opt for an acetone-free version, since acetone is a no-go for hand luggage. Anyway, you can grab a bottle of perfume, as long as it's not too large and you don't use it on board. It would be a pity to leave a whole bottle in the trash bin before boarding. Still, you can sneak in the plane with more than 3.4 ounces of your favorite cream, claiming it's some medicine that you really need. But you do need to notify the airport beforehand. A bit weird, but it works. Sometimes. In case you need to check your body temperature on board, make sure your thermometer is electronic. Mercury ones are strictly forbidden. Who's going to pick up all the mercury balls if you accidentally drop it? Bowling pins are a no-go for hand luggage. Seems like the air crew doesn't want anyone to have fun and play bowling in the aisles during a long and boring flight. No, it's all about our safety. They just think bowling pins might hurt someone. No sports equipment is allowed, be it a fencing foil, a bat, or even darts. Darts are sharp, and no sharp objects are allowed on board. Such items should travel in check-in luggage, unless you want them to end up in an auction. If you're into handmade things, and a transatlantic flight gives you enough time to knit a scarf or a pair of socks, Opt for plastic or wooden knitting needles and wrap them carefully so as not to cause any damage. Those made of metal will probably be disposed of by melting, and they don't deserve such a fate. Snow globes, as with any other object containing liquid inside, aren't allowed through security. If your snow globe is as small as a tennis ball, you may be lucky to have it allowed, but it's better to play it safe and check the snow globe in. Liquid bleach is definitely a weird object for hand luggage, even if you're traveling in a white shirt. First, it's not allowed on board because it's highly flammable. Second, a brand new white shirt doesn't seem to be the right choice for a flight. <laughs> Coffee and turbulence just don't mix. Third, the bathroom on board is far too small for laundering. If you're a hairdresser on a business trip, you'll probably have to invest a bit more when booking your flight. No hair bleach is allowed on board. Scissors aren't welcome either, unless their blades are four inches or shorter. By the way, scissors that aren't allowed to fly are often donated to schools, which is a good alternative to disposing them. Bad news for hairdressers again. Due to a gas cartridge that's filled with butane, cordless curling irons aren't allowed on board. Good news, electric curling irons are completely fine and safe. If you're an artist, you must have already struggled with security rules. You don't want your paint to get frozen or ruined in the luggage section, so you'll surely want to bring it on board. Security may be okay with your oil paints, as long as they're under 3.4 ounces, but there's no way you can grab your extremely flammable turpentine. Now, in case you don't enjoy food on a plane and failed to order a meal on board beforehand, 
You can take any pan or pot on board and cook it yourself. No, you can't cook. And you can't grab a cast iron pan either. They're quite heavy. That's why they're likely to be dangerous. If a TSA agent confiscates it, it won't end up being donated to a local kitchen. It'll probably be melted. If you want to have some fresh smoothies while flying with fresh fruit that are allowed on board, like an apple or a banana, bad news for you. Blenders are allowed only in case you remove the blades. So technically, it's not a blender anymore. Hey, here's when you need that cheese grater. English Christmas crackers can make a wonderful atmosphere of joy and happiness during Christmas holidays, but it brings nothing but a mess on board. It makes a cracking sound when pulled, which can frighten other passengers. They are not allowed in checked bags, just like party poppers and sparklers. High heels and thick soles aren't prohibited, but they do cause some problems. If you're wearing one of these, you may be asked to take them off to have them scanned. Sure, there are some plastic shoe covers, but ugh, these airport floors are swarming with germs. Wedding dresses are a bit of a problem too. Some dresses just don't fit in the x-ray machine, so they might need to be double-checked. All the fans of camping, beware. You probably want to check in a lot of luggage required for your trip, so make sure you check in the tent pegs too. Though, if you travel light with a carry-on backpack only, you'll probably need to buy some when you reach your destination. Since they're sharp objects, tent pegs are not allowed on board. It's hard to imagine anyone having a drill inside their five-pound carry-on luggage. But anyways, these are not allowed. So if you're a creative person who wants to bring a drill home as a vacation souvenir because magnets are lame, you'll have to check it in. If you want to sneak in a plane with a dry ice DIY fridge, you're almost sure to fail. It's flammable, so safety regulations definitely prohibit it on board. You can bring up to 5.5 pounds of dry ice, but airline permission is required. Anything with an uncovered blade is not allowed through security. Instead, a disposable razor or cartridge blades can be taken on board. Box cutters and knives, with a teeny tiny exception of a smooth butter knife, should be in checked luggage. Soap bars are allowed on board, but don't panic if a TSA agent wants to double check your bag after scanning it. It just may look a bit odd on the screen and mislead them. Liquid soap, instead, follows the universal liquid rule. Rules for batteries may vary. Spillable batteries are allowed neither in carry-on nor in checked luggage. And lithium batteries also can't be carried on board, only because if damaged, they can cause a fire. Okay, you travel with your Mr. Scratchy. And yes, a laser pointer is your furry friend's favorite toy. But you gotta make do without it this time, buddy. Laser pointers are not allowed in carry-on nor in checked luggage. A walking stick can be used as a mobility device and then let on board. But surprisingly, TSA may prohibit this item sometimes. Play it safe and notify your airline in advance. Bon voyage! Welcome aboard our flight from London to Miami. It will take us 4 hours and 30 minutes. The weather in Miami is... Wait, did the pilot just say 4 hours and a half? It sounds like a dream, but it will most likely become our reality in less than 10 years from now. Boom Supersonic, an aircraft manufacturer, is working on a passenger supersonic jet called the Overture that will be able to carry 65 to 80 people at twice the speed of current commercial aircraft. One of the major American airlines is interested in buying around 40 planes. The plane that's going to cost $200 million has recently passed the wind tunnel tests. If all goes well, the first finished Overture prototype will roll off the line in 2025 and will travel at nearly twice the speed of sound. The plane will be able to show its top speed over the sea, so it should be ideal for transatlantic flights. And then, traveling from, say, New York to Paris should take no longer than four hours. But first, it will have to get all the official permissions to do it. Some people are skeptical about the whole passenger superjet concept as they remember the story of the Concorde. That high-end plane delivered people from London to New York in about three hours and serviced other transatlantic connections. The tickets cost a whopping $10,000 per seat and passengers got access to a super exclusive lounge with lobster and Angus beef for lunch. The Concorde went on its final commercial flight in 2003 it was a huge fuel guzzler. Plus, there are many complaints from people living near airports about the noise it produced. The Overture is supposed to be more fuel efficient, lighter, and have better software to make it more aerodynamic. 
The noise might still be a problem, though, because supersonic aircraft need aerodynamic engines, which are pretty loud. That will definitely change in the future, as planes have gone a long way since their first flight in 1903. Back then, the Wright brothers started the aerial age with a 12-second flight traveling 120 feet in North Carolina. The top speed at that time was around 30 miles per hour, but it still seemed pretty impressive. The world's first passenger airline service took off just 11 years later. The flight from St. Petersburg, Florida to Tampa, Florida lasted 23 minutes. Covering the distance by car around the bay took about 20 hours, so that was a great time saver. The tickets cost $5 and were sold out 16 weeks in advance, but the airline went out of business in four months. The new age in aviation began in the 1950s when they introduced the turbofan engine. It became possible as they started using temperature-resistant materials and complex air cooling systems. Planes also became lighter as they were made of composite materials. The wings have also improved over the years. The airfoil, that's the part thanks to which the air travels faster above the wing than below it, became a real game changer. Thanks to it, the planes keep a low speed during takeoff, which means they move smoothly and burn less fuel. The fastest plane in the world so far is North American X-15. It was rocket-powered and made of aluminum and titanium. A huge wedge tail helped it stay stable at that super speed. The rocket plane set the world's altitude record, reaching an altitude of 67 miles. Oh, and to make it even more impressive, it happened back in 1967. So, if it was possible back then already, why don't we all just fly rocket planes, or at least supersonics, especially on long-distance flights? In terms of speed, passenger planes are still where they were 50 years ago, mostly because speeding flights up would also make them way more expensive. Flying faster means burning more fuel. Plus, supersonic engines are expensive to produce and maintain. Another reason is natural forces. The winds affect the speed of a plane, and no technology can control the wind. A strong tailwind can help it move forward at a higher speed, and a headwind can slow the aircraft down. Planes mostly fly at altitudes of up to 7 miles. Up there, the air is thinner, which means there's less resistance, and a plane can fly faster and save some fuel. Also, the lower temperatures make the jet engines more efficient. Another perk of flying through that part of the atmosphere is that it's less turbulent, so flights go smoother. Private jets can't fly that high. They're smaller, and their engines aren't strong enough to reach such an altitude, so they stick around to 15,000 feet. Ever notice those white trails that planes leave behind? Their official name is contrails, and they're like artificial clouds planes leave behind. When the plane reaches its cruising altitude, temperatures get quite low, about negative 67 degrees Fahrenheit, and the water turns into particles of ice. The higher the level of humidity is, the bigger those trails get, and you can see them long after the plane has disappeared. So, thick and long contrails can be a sign of an upcoming storm. Sometimes contrails can even be colorful. The droplets of water that are formed up in the atmosphere can freeze in different sizes. They all reflect sunlight at different wavelengths, causing the effect of a rainbow. When all the colors mix, it appears white, the most common contrail color. Airplanes don't take off with the wind, but actually against it. It's kind of like a kite. To make it fly, you launch it against the wind, and there it goes. That's because there are four forces of flight, lift, weight, thrust, and drag. The lift is generated because the speed of the air is higher above the kite than below it. The kite is pushed upwards. This is the lifting force. Going through a storm is one pretty scary experience. But is it really as dangerous as it seems? In fact, the most critical moments in windy weather are takeoff and landing. Plane manufacturers test their aircraft and specify speed limits at which the pilots should move in different weather conditions. At some airports, the winds are pretty severe all year round, so landing can get pretty wobbly. It requires a real pro of a pilot to land when the wind strikes the runway. Sometimes, the wind unexpectedly changes its speed and direction. The pilot really has to know what they're doing to land when the wind direction changes. 
Otherwise, the risk of overshooting the runway is pretty real. Extreme heat is another weather condition that can stop a plane from flying. Airplanes fly by generating lift with their wings. The air below the wings takes the plane up. In extreme heat, an airplane can't produce that much lift. That's because hot air expands and becomes way less dense than cold air. With less lift, the plane may find it really hard to take off and fly. Electronics will unlikely respond well to extreme heat or humidity, and the AC system may fail. Smaller jets can't operate at a temperature of over 118 degrees Fahrenheit. Larger Airbus and Boeing planes perform the best below 126 degrees Fahrenheit. Those mysterious chimes you hear during the flight are a kind of a secret language the crew uses to communicate with each other. The chime you hear shortly after takeoff informs the crew that the landing gear is getting retracted. A single chime during the flight is a sign that one of the passengers needs the assistance of the crew. When they're serving meals and run out of food and drinks, they can ask their colleagues to share using a high and low chime combo. Three low tones means serious turbulence is approaching, so the crew needs to buckle up. Have you ever noticed the flashing light in the cabin before takeoff? You have nothing to worry about. It occurs when the pilot disconnects a plane from the airport power supply and it switches to the onboard one. This rapid transition may cause flashing. The Himalayas have some of the highest peaks in the world, including Mount Everest. But it's no surprise airplanes find it difficult to navigate the area. But why are commercial airplanes actually banned from flying there? For starters, these mountains have an average height of more than 20,000 feet. Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the entire world, stands at 29,037 feet high above sea level. The area is rough filled with snow and has almost no flat surfaces. In case of sudden cabin depressurization, it would be really difficult to perform an emergency landing since there's literally no flat area there. More so, the low oxygen environment at such an altitude means there's likely to be a lot of turbulence. Not only is it really unpleasant for passengers, but random air movements and high wind velocity means that it's really difficult to maneuver the airplane. This area is also quite low populated so there's not much there in terms of radar systems. And radar is crucial for aviation safety. Without radars, pilots would be unable to communicate with the ground to figure out flight conditions. It can also get so cold up there that jet fuel might completely freeze. Sure, the fuels used in airplanes usually freeze at around negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but it may be possible above Everest. The lowest temperature was recorded there back in December 2004, when thermometers showed a staggering minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit. So, no wonder pilots don't want to ever take that risk, especially on a commercial flight. Among the few airports located in the Himalayas, there's one considered to be the most challenging to land in the world. Only eight pilots on the planet are certified to do it. It's called Paro International Airport, and it's located in Bhutan a landlocked country in the eastern Himalayas. First, landing there is so dangerous because you're literally flying through some of the world's tallest mountain peaks. Not to mention that those eight pilots also have to consider strong winds. Despite the challenges, they do manage to safely land over 30,000 people each year. Moving further, there's no radar there to guide the pilots, so they need to maneuver the aircraft entirely in manual mode. The pilots need to track their movements based on specific visual landmark checkpoints as they approach the runway. Moreover, flights are only allowed there during daylight hours and under good visibility. These pilots also need to watch out for utility poles and roofs on the hillsides too. It means they often squeeze their planes between mountain peaks at 45 degree angles before dropping quickly onto the runway. No wonder only two airlines fly to Paro International Airport. Apart from these commercial pilots, there are specially trained helicopter rescue pilots who spend most of their career at 20,000 feet in the sky. Most of the time, they partner with equally experienced climbers who train by crossing the Kumbu Icefall. It's dubbed the most dangerous square mile on the planet. Made up of ice pillars as tall as a six-story building, this huge stretch of the glacier on Everest's western side is filled with bottomless ice holes. It takes between 4 to 12 hours to get from one edge of the icefall to the other, depending on the experience of the climber. 
you may think it's a pretty serene location since you're literally only surrounded by ice and snow, but these local professionals claim otherwise. One Everest veteran said that the noise was actually the worst part of the job. The mountain produces awful squeaking sounds and sometimes even sighs. It often makes people feel like it's talking to them, warning them about the treacherous environment. Mount Everest isn't the only no-fly zone in the world. Surprisingly, Disney parks are also part of this exclusive club. So you won't ever be able to look out of your plane window and see the beauty of fairy tale castles from up above. In recent years, a lot of crowded tourist attractions, including Disney parks, have increased their security measures to make sure their visitors are as safe as possible. As such, no aircraft is allowed to fly within 3,000 feet of Disneyland in California or Walt Disney World in Florida. It was initially a temporary ban, but this rule became permanent back in 2003. Some other places don't have planes flying over them because of their historical importance, like Machu Picchu, located in the Peruvian Andes Mountains. There's also a large number of rare wildlife species and plants that grow exclusively in this area. It's crucial that they're protected as well as possible. What does it have to do with planes not flying over that area? Firstly, it reduces the volume of harmful chemicals in the area. Secondly, if a plane ever needed to perform an emergency landing in this location, it'd cause irreversible damage to buildings and wildlife. Surprisingly, planes can fly over the Greek Parthenon in Athens, but with one condition, not to get closer than 5,000 feet above it. This way, the historical building is kept a bit more protected from any emergency landings, since there are specially designated areas around it. You won't be able to see the Taj Mahal from above either, since it's one of the most important, oldest, and most beautiful pieces of architecture in the world. It also needs added security features. This building dates back to the 1600s. UNESCO announced it a World Heritage Site in 1983. The Indian authorities set up a no-fly zone above it in 2006. They did it to safeguard not only the building itself, but also the crowds of tourists that come there each year. 7 to 8 million people. Buckingham Palace is well known for being the residence of British monarchs. So, for the Queen's security, a no-fly zone was set up here too. Planes aren't allowed to fly over Windsor Castle either to make sure the royal family is equally protected. Other important British buildings with no-fly zones include Number 10 Downing Street, the British Prime Minister's official residence and office, and the Houses of Parliament. George Washington's home in Mount Vernon, Virginia, can only have planes flying above it at more than 1,500 feet. The historical wooden mansion was built for President George Washington between 1758 and 1778. Unfortunately, the building has seen a lot of damage over the years. So, in an effort to preserve it better, authorities decided to prohibit vibrations produced by flying aircraft. That's why another no-fly zone was established there. It covers the airspace above this National Historic Landmark. That's probably the reason why you'll rarely see pictures of this house from above. Since it's the resident of the U.S. President, it's not allowed to fly over Washington, D.C. It's also the home of Congress and other establishments. So, the authorities set a special flight rules area, stretching for 30 miles around Ronald Reagan International Airport. This means that it's one of the airports with the most precise takeoffs and landings. Pilots have to carefully tackle no-fly zones, which sometimes results in uncomfortable takeoffs for passengers. Whenever a pilot breaks a no-fly zone, it's a big problem, like the one that happened back in 2005 when a pilot accidentally steered the plane into a prohibited zone. The capital had to be evacuated immediately, and their regular activities were interrupted. Other capitals of the world have similar requirements, like Budapest, for example. In the capital city of Hungary, planes aren't allowed to fly over the ancient inner city of Pest and the Buda Hills. Almost all air traffic is generally prohibited above Paris, too, with some exceptions. Aircrafts flying no lower than 6,500 feet. Flying helicopters are also a big no-no within the city limits. Only certain choppers undertaking precise missions can get special authorization. Generally, passenger planes aren't allowed near the island of Manhattan either, partly because of the really tall buildings there and the added risk of collision. 
but mostly because all three major New York airports, John F. Kennedy International Airport, Newark Liberty International Airport, and LaGuardia Airport are very close to each other. So the air traffic in the area has to be really well thought out to make sure the planes don't cross paths. It seems strange that a commercial jet doesn't have keys to turn it on, but it's a bit more complicated than just turning a key. Instead, there's a series of buttons and dials on the control board that starts the complicated process. A battery provides the power to the aircraft that is charged through a small electric generator within the jet's tail. Airflow gets in and moves into the jet's engines to keep them cool. A reserve power then warms the turbines by turning them slowly until they start spinning at the right rate. Then, the engines can be turned on one at a time. With up to four engines on a commercial jet, this entire process can take up to 90 minutes. Planes don't have keys to lock the doors either, but when they sit idle, jets have security guards constantly monitoring them. But even if someone happened to get past them, it wouldn't be a quick getaway. When you enter the plane, the captain keeps a close eye on the boarding process. They are not only in command of the flight deck, but also of the passenger's cabin. To become a commercial pilot, you gotta have a distance vision of at least 20-20. But depending on the airline, it's sometimes okay if your perfect vision is assisted with glasses. It's time to find a seat on the plane. You checked in late, and you've already had an unpleasant experience of not getting on your flight like that in the past. This is because airlines purposely overbook their flights, just in case there are no-shows or cancellations. So, you didn't get to choose your seat this time. You walk past the front seats in jealousy. There are seats that are always taken much faster because everyone wants to leave the plane as soon as possible after it lands. But if you're choosing safety over early departure, the back is the place to be. It's estimated to be 40% safer in the rear end of the plane. Maybe you prefer to drive instead of flying? The chances of something dangerous happening to a plane during a flight are 1 in 11 million. Compare it to the likelihood of a car accident, which is 1 in 5,000. You've been placed at the emergency exit. Excellent! More legroom! Over the past 30 years, legroom has been decreasing more with every year. Up to 5 inches on some airlines. No, you haven't been getting taller. The reason behind this is the more people they're able to fit in, the more money the airline makes. Airlines don't build their own aircraft and use factory-made planes. From there, each airline will determine its own seating structure. This is also why the seats don't line up with the windows. But it doesn't matter, you have the best seat, although it's always a bit concerning when sitting next to an emergency door. What if you accidentally knocked it while asleep and opened it? Relax, it's actually impossible to open these doors while flying. The air pressure inside pushes against every square inch of the cabin. On the door itself, this pressure equates to 1,000 pounds across every square foot of the door. But even if you somehow developed Hulk-like strength in your sleep, you still wouldn't be able to open it as there's a series of electrical and mechanical devices that latch it closed. The extra measures are important as the moment the door opens, the entire cabin temperature would quickly drop, and that drastic change in pressure would weaken the plane's structure. It's time for takeoff, and they've asked you to turn your phone off. Should you really? 10% of people have admitted that they don't turn theirs off and don't even set them to airplane mode. Cell phones can cause issues, but they don't disrupt the electronics as you might believe. There is a genuine concern that while you're flying in the air, your phone can receive signals from multiple towers on the ground, providing stronger distractions for the pilots. So let's make their job a little easier and turn it off. The plane has reached 40,000 feet, your ears have popped, and the seatbelt sign is turned off. The flight attendant walks down the aisle with their arms held outward. Within such a thin passage, they walk this way as it helps with their balance. They try to avoid disrupting passengers, so they don't use the headrest of the seats. And in case of sudden turbulence, there are special grabbing spots under the overhead luggage bay. It's estimated that half a million people are flying in the sky at any given time. So right now, you're part of that special group involving 0.1% of the world's population.
You look out the window and notice the white wings. Planes are painted white and other lighter colors as well to help reflect solar radiation. This avoids damage from the sun by reducing the amount of heat the plane receives. But further in the distance, dark clouds approach and the plane is heading towards a thunderstorm. Since it's made of metal, it has to be a big electric conductor, right? Thankfully, jets are fitted with an aluminum shell that conducts electricity very well. The cabin's interior is completely shielded from lightning, protecting electrical systems and leaving us carbon-based mammals unhurt. A plane is so perfectly built for electrical storms that it's one of the safest places to be. There haven't been any major incidents from a storm since the 1960s. You're thirsty and you're aware that you should have brought your own water. When aircrafts land at each location, they refill their water supplies. The water quality in a plane is based on where they collected the vital liquid. Many things contribute to the water quality of every airport. Water cabinets, trucks, carts, and hoses all could be of different standards. In 2019, an airline water study found that most airlines weren't providing clean water, so the general recommendation is to only drink water from a sealed bottle and avoid even tea. But the food is perfectly fine. As you sit back down, you notice the cabin is cold. Super cold, to be honest. It's intentionally set to around 71 degrees Fahrenheit for a good reason. When people become vulnerable to fainting, it's due to not receiving enough oxygen. And when there's warm air mixed with high cabin pressure, fainting becomes more common. So, while the cold air is helping those who need it, you've been provided with a blanket for your comfort. Warmed up with a blanket, you notice the dry air running through your nose, and it dehydrates your lips and eyes. But don't worry, the air is completely safe and very clean. 40% of the air is recycled and goes through a thorough cleaning system to remove all dust and airborne bacteria, and the other 60% comes from the outside. The humidity levels in the air get very low, and that's why you feel all that discomfort. It's now dark outside as the plane begins its descent to land, and the lights are dimmed. The dimmed lights aren't for the pilots or crew or those at the airport. They're for you. If something goes wrong while landing when it's dark, they'll have to start an emergency procedure. The dimmed lights are there to help your eyes adjust and help you follow towards the exit in the dark easier. But luckily, today, it won't be necessary, as your journey has come to an end. Is the sky like a desert? Can a commercial aircraft fly faster than the speed of sound? Can you fix a plane with a piece of tape? Let's check your intuition with this cool truth or myth airplane quiz. Make sure to note down your correct answers and share your score in the comments. So, the first one for you. Commercial airplanes are more fuel efficient than your car. True or false? That's actually true. Commercial flights have been more fuel efficient per person per mile than cars for more than a decade. Better technologies and a larger number of people that fit in one plane have decreased the energy intensity of traveling by air by almost 74%. As for cars, it's been just a 57% drop. Okay, how about this one? There's no row 13 on a plane. Well, come to think of it, I've never seen a 13A or any other letter on my boarding pass. What about you? That's true, but only partially. In those countries where the number 13 is considered unlucky, there's really no row 13. But in other countries, the missing number may differ depending on what is believed to bring bad luck there. Opening a plane door during the flight is a real safety risk. It sounds kind of terrifying to me, but is it true? You can relax, that's just a myth. For one thing, the doors are locked, but even if they weren't, no one can open the door of a flying plane. It's physically impossible. The cabin pressure won't allow anybody to do it. When an airplane is at cruising altitude, it's pressurized. The difference between the inside and outside is huge. In other words, the pressure inside the cabin pushes on the door and doesn't allow anyone to open it from the inside. Even better, the airplane door is called a plug door. Its inner edge is wider than the outer. That's why it acts like a bathtub drain stopper, corking the doorway without falling through. Your skin is drier on a plane than it would be in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Can you believe this? And if you think this is true, you're absolutely right. 
The airplane cabin is pressurized, and the humidity there is set to 20%. For comparison, in the Sahara Desert, the average air humidity is around 25%, and your skin is used to at least 40% of humidity. That's why your nose and throat feel so dry when you're flying. Several years ago, someone posted a photo on the internet that became viral in no time. In this image, there was an airline technician, and he seemed to be fixing a plane with duct tape. So the question is, could it be true? Or was it just a fake? The answer isn't so simple. It wasn't your regular duct tape, so partially, this fact is a myth. But it was some kind of tape, known as speed tape. It costs around $700 per roll. It's actually an aluminum adhesive you can use to temporarily mend minor damage until you can repair it properly. Is it true that pilots avoid the Bermuda Triangle? After all, it has such a notorious reputation. Ships and planes simply disappear into thin air in this region. This one is certainly a myth. Today, people already know that there's no particular danger in the Bermuda Triangle, and planes fly over this area as usual. Airplanes mostly fly on their own, with autopilots doing all the work. Myth or truth? What's your bet? It's a widespread myth. Many people are sure that planes are some super automated mechanisms that can fly mostly by themselves, and pilots are there simply for backup. In reality though, flying is a hands-on job. It needs constant attention and a skilled flight crew. There once was a plane that flew twice faster than the speed of sound. Hmm, can it be true, or is it too far-fetched? This fact is definitely not a myth. The Concorde could reach a speed of 1,330 miles per hour. That's much faster than the speed of sound, which is around 767 miles per hour. And that's indeed almost twice as slow as the Concorde. You might have heard this scary fact before. Planes empty toilets right in the air. Sounds alarming, but is it true? Fortunately, that's only a myth. There's absolutely nothing to this legend. Airplane toilets use a vacuum-based system to transport all the contents out of the bowl and into a special tank. It's located in the rear part of the aircraft, and this tank gets emptied only on the ground. Ah, this is a tricky one. When a plane is flying towards the east, it can reach higher speeds. So, can the speed really depend on the direction? And this is true. It's possible thanks to high-altitude winds known as jet streams. They blow at a speed of 100 to 300 miles per hour. And since our planet rotates from west to east, aircraft moving in the same direction can use these winds to move faster. Do you think pilots can control airflow to keep passengers sleepy and relaxed and save on fuel? This one is definitely a myth. If you ask a pilot this question, you might hear ridiculous in reply. The truth is that pressurization determines the oxygen level in the cabin. How about this one? The world's tallest air traffic control tower is as high as a skyscraper. Can it be true? Or is it just an impressive myth? I know it's hard to believe, but it's actually true. When an airplane lands, it needs the assistance of runway lights and airport beacons. It's part of the responsibilities of the air traffic control tower. It also manages ground traffic. No wonder such construction needs to be extra tall. The new Bangkok International Airport in Thailand has a 430-foot four-tall tower. Its height is almost the same as the height of a 40-story building. It cost 18 million to build the tower. I've got another tough one for you. The sensitivity of your taste buds drop by 30% during the flight. Yes or no? This is true. The pressure in the cabin combined with the dryness of the air kind of numbs your taste buds. But the most curious thing here is that this mostly affects salty and sweet flavors. If you're served something spicy or bitter, you can still taste it as usual. Airline caterers try to take the decreased sensitivity of your taste buds into account while preparing airplane meals. They have to modify lots of good old recipes to make your food taste better. As soon as your oxygen mask is on, in case the cabin is depressurized, you can relax and breathe out. You can still use it till the end of the flight. I wish it was true, but is it? Sadly, it's a myth. 
Passenger oxygen masks usually provide enough air to breathe normally for 10 to 15 minutes. In other words, it's just a temporary solution. But in most cases, this time is enough for the plane to go down to the altitude of 10,000 feet. That's where people can breathe without using oxygen masks. And since planes descend very fast, the need for additional oxygen lasts for a few minutes at most. By the way, the oxygen system gets tested regularly during special maintenance checks. Plus, both passengers' and pilots' oxygen flow doesn't depend on electricity. Masks use individual oxygen generators, so even if there's some electrical problem on board, the oxygen doesn't get cut off. Many people say that the plane is the safest means of travel, but do you believe in it? That's a myth. Flying is the second safest. Studies show that the elevator is safer. Unfortunately, it won't be able to take you to the Bahamas. Okay, this last one was kind of a joke. Statistically, planes are indeed the safest way to get to your destination. So, how many correct answers did you have? Tell me in the comments below. Me, eight. Duh. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or